Welcome to another episode of Southern Arizona's Nonprofits, the superheroes impacting our community. We're broadcasting live today on the Tucson Business Channel, a division of Mark Bishop Media, from the Stewart Title Corporate Offices on Broadway in Tucson, Arizona. This show is brought to you by SCIP, SSCIP, the Social Service Contractors Indemnity Pool, insuring nonprofits like ours for more than three and a half decades. I'm Barbara McClure, Executive Director of Impact of Southern Arizona, host of the show. And with me today are two community leaders from organizations involving our outdoor environments. Particularly, we'll be talking about gardening and farming, but also the ancient traditional ways of farming, new innovative options for providing food to our communities in the future. Please join me in welcoming two gentlemen from two terrific Tucson tourist destinations, places you just might want to visit this summer. I have with me Dr. or John Adams, Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer of Biosphere 2. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Sure, we're excited to hear what's going on. And then Dr. Kendall Crozen, Outreach Coordinator for Mission Garden. And then I always thought of it as just Mission Garden, but it's also Friends of Tucson's Birthplace. So that's pretty fun. Yes, Friends of Tucson's Birthplace is the nonprofit organization that manages Mission Garden. There you go. All right. Well, thank you for the clarity, <laughs> and thank you for joining me today. We are um, so excited to live in Tucson where we have so many fun things, and I have to say Biosphere was one of the first places we visited when we moved to Tucson. So how about if I start with you, John, and you tell me a little bit about Biosphere and maybe the history of it? Yeah, I mean, I think for most of us here in Tucson, we've all heard of Biosphere 2, and I think it you know, came on most of our radar screens, if we can remember back to sort of the late 80s, early 90s, with this really ambitious, almost audacious group of folks who had this idea of, you know, could we build a facility to allow us to better understand Earth itself? Um, but what captured all of the headlines was this really futuristic structure that could potentially be used in some capacity or as a model of what it would take to put a habitat on the moon or Mars. And so that's what captured all the headlines, where really at its foundation for Bias for Two, and even today, was understanding Earth itself and and those complexities and intricacies. But eight people were sealed inside uh, in 1991. So that's, what, 31 years ago now? Oh, gosh. And... um, But they were inside for two years. In my opinion, it was hugely successful. But you'll read in a lot of the popular media how they will say that that first experiment failed. But you can never have experiment and failed in the same sentence, in my opinion. So they just don't go together. The reason we do experiments is to try to understand something that we don't know. Then, as it is today, no one has ever built anything as large as Bias for Two that rivals the seal and the complexities that it has. Now, we have lots of greenhouses around the world that have much bigger footprints, but they're growing lettuce or tomatoes or strawberries or other crops. Inside Bias for Two, these systems are really diverse. The facility was hermetically sealed. It only lost 10% of its air annually. So that leak rate rivals that of the International Space Station. It's like a 1,000 times more well-sealed than your typical building. So from an engineering perspective, it was remarkable. From an ecological perspective, it worked pretty well. There were some things that went wrong that they didn't anticipate necessarily, but you know they overcame those as we always do. Because uh, there was a lot of folks who said, there's no way that's going to self-organize. A couple of years, it's just going to fall apart, and we're not going to even be able to recognize what's inside there. And that's not the case. You come today, you can walk through, and you can see these very complex systems that are still in place. In our rainforest, we have over 100 different species interacting and, and living with one another. In our ocean system, you know, we have fish and invertebrates and algae that are still functioning. And we use all the systems in Biosphere 2 to do some really cutting-edge experiments that you can't do anywhere else in the world. Gosh, that's exciting. I had no idea there were that many critters inside <laughs> that and I think it's amazing the ocean was really impressive to me when I first saw it. Yeah, this is a tank that's its size is a million gallons. Um, it does have sort of topography or relief inside of it. So it's got a, a deep end and it comes up into sort of a rocky reef and then back on the backside of shallow lagoon. But what's really incredible about it is it's the world's largest experimental tank. And what I mean by like that, it's not the world's largest tank. So we know NASA, we know Georgia Aquarium and other places have much larger tanks. But what we're willing to do that they're not as an example is that in our system, we're willing to change the conditions. And mostly we change those conditions like what we predict are going to be coming in the future. And then we look at the response of the system. So it's essentially a time machine. We can jump forward 
um, cause these climate change events and look at how it responds or how our system responds and hopefully to help inform our researchers and those that are outside looking at the data that we're we're gathering to better understand what the potential implications are for our natural systems and how they may change. Because the, you know, the big lesson for B2, in my opinion, is, is that we may not be able to stop some of these changes. They may be too far down the road. But if we don't even know what's coming our way, we can't adapt. And if we can't adapt, we're not going to survive. Sure. Gosh, it sounds like such fun. And you were talking about in the very beginning. So originally it was privately funded. Was that true? Or who owned it in the beginning? Because now, of course... Yeah, the U of A. Yes, the University of Arizona uh, owns and operates Bias for Two, but that was not always the case. So it was privately financed by a gentleman by the name of Ed Bass. Uh, the estimated construction cost or the initial investment that he made is on the order of about $250 million. Um, and then shortly after that first group came out of their two-year mission, another group went in. They were inside for about six months. But then in early 1994, things really started to change the Bass organization and their team decided that they wanted to look at possibly using bias for two in a slightly different way. Rather than having people sealed inside, let's use it for earth and environmental sciences and research. And so that started a transition that ultimately led to Columbia University coming in and assuming management in January of 1996. And they really established a very important scientific foundation, but ultimately they had some administrative changes back at their home institution. So a person that we we all know about, and it definitely is a rival up the road, but Michael Crow, who's president of Arizona State University, he was one of the individuals who was responsible for the oversight of Bias for Two on behalf of Columbia. So he he departed, went up to ASU. The sitting president, he was an outgoing as well, and the new incoming administration had um, different focuses that they wanted to have. And running a facility 3,000 miles away like Bias for Two is not trivial. So they decided to, to pull back from managing the facility. And then in 2007, the University of Arizona stepped in and Joaqu under the guidance of Joaquin Ruiz, who at the time was the dean of the College of Science. And what he said is that the university is very interested, but we're really interested if the science that we can do inside Bias for Two can't be done anywhere else in the world. And that was the conclusion and is why the university is still involved today. Oh, that's exciting. I never really made that connection either, but it makes sense because yeah. it's such a unique structure. Very fun. And then um, I was going to ask you also, Kendall, because, of course, you have lots of critters on your property. So maybe you could tell our listeners about Mission Garden and what that is. I visited it for the first time maybe about just before COVID, maybe a few years before that, and was shocked to even discover it was there. Well, yes, it's a remarkable place. Uh, in 1999, voters passed a bond election which was to fund uh, the, the rebuilding of historic assets near downtown over at the base of a mountain. And as things developed and as the Rio Nuevo Tax Incentive Fund uh, began to plan this new development, they had plans to for something called the Tucson Origins Heritage Park, which was to rebuild the Mission San Agustin that was located there, the Mission Garden, a uh, historic house that was owned by Leopoldo Carrillo, and a Native American village that had been there called Chukshan, from which the very name Tucson comes from. And uh, as things developed, uh, mm -hmm. they created the blueprints and all the plans for this park, and they began in 2008 building Mission Garden, building the rebuilding the wall around the garden, which had been there historically during the mission period, during the essentially the late 1700s and early 1800s. And uh, then the recession came, the money dried up, the Rio Nuevo had some difficulties, and uh, there was a wall with nothing inside. Oh. Our, uh, our nonprofit organization, Friends of Tucson's Birthplace, began to form and incorporated in 2010. And by 2012, had uh, raised enough money and uh, gotten the relevant permission from Rio Nuevo, the city of Tucson, and the county, Pima County, which owns the land inside the garden. And we were able to start replanting that garden. And the idea was to have a part of the garden that recreated the um, mission era agriculture, all of the fruit trees and grapevines and vegetables and grains uh, that were brought by the missionaries and the Spanish colonists to that area, but also have many other garden plots within that four-acre area, pretty large area, 
that represented many other time periods, many other eras, many other cultures that have been uh, growing crops on the floodplain of the Santa Cruz River in the Tucson area for, uh, we know, over 4,000 years, and archaeologists are now saying possibly as much as 5,000 years ago is when corn came into the area and began to start being grown in the summer um, there. So today, uh, to date, we have uh, recreated the an agriculture of the mission period, but also the early corn agriculture of two to probably 5,000 years ago, the Hohokam garden, which represents the Hohokam uh, culture and the corn, beans, and squash, and cotton, and agaves that they were growing, and uh, an autumn garden. We have a native plant garden, which uh, represents the native plants that people uh, gathered food and medicine and building materials from as well. Um, we have a Mexican period garden, for there was a period of uh, over 30 years when this region was a part of Mexico. We have a Chinese garden because there were Chinese gardeners and farmers on the floodplain of the Santa Cruz River uh, starting in the 1870s. And uh, there's just so many different cultures that have contributed. And we're, and we're building more gardens as we go along, and I'll talk about those later. But uh, there's just so many different cultures that have contributed to local agriculture and contributed so many n different crops over thousands of years. It's created this deep historical record of agriculture in Tucson that is part of the reason that Tucson was recognized in 2015 by UNESCO as a, the first uh, U.S. city of gastronomy. Uh, you know, there's a vibrant multicultural restaurant scene and local food production, but a big part of that recognition was for this deep, diverse history of crops and cultures growing food along the Santa Cruz River. That is interesting because I think people think Tucson doesn't have a varied culture, you know, especially if you've come from other cities. Um, so it's interesting to hear that the Chinese were here on the river and all these other people. And then, of course, the Native Americans have been here for so long. One of the key things I mentioned during tours of the garden is that uh, as we grow up and, and learn about American history, history, at least in my day, we tended to learn that it unfurled from east to west. So it all right. started in the east, right? <laughs> yes. And it gradually came west. But really, uh, for thousands of years, our region here in Tucson and southern Arizona has been more influenced by from the south, the influence of Mesoamerican cultures on the Hohokam, for example, and then the arrival of Sp uh, European missionaries and Spanish colonists coming from the south, and the administration of this region from Mexico City during the Mexican period. It was really only in uh, uh, 1854 with the Gadsden Purchase that uh, a lot of influences from the eastern United States started to affect this area a lot. That's a fun perspective because I'm a West Coast girl. I grew up on the West Coast, on California and then Washington. So you're right. I think when you, especially when you live on the West Coast, you think everything started over there <laughs> and finally made its way. So that is really interesting to think about how busy it was here already before pilgrims started landing and everybody... <laughs> developed it all on that end. So that's a fun way to look at kind of the, I don't know, the discovery of America, if you will. Well, it's such a fun place. And I know earlier you were talking about how there are lots of creatures in the garden right now in the summertime. And I imagine it's a lot of people would probably think it's way too hot to come out to Mission Garden right now. But is there area that is shaded and cool or do people come in the morning? Is it open early? Well, I think when a lot of people see all those things, when a lot, when people think of gardens, they think of rows of crops that are maybe a foot or two high. And what you find in Mission Garden, you do find that in Mission Garden, but you find many, many trees, many uh, fruit trees in our Spanish colonial orchard, many grapevines growing over a very shady arbor, uh, many big um, mesquite trees and other native trees that cast a lot of shade. So there's many, and there's also many ramadas in different styles from different eras, everything from a hohokam, an autumn ramada, to a Spanish ramada, to a mesquite ramada, 
to um, you know the Spanish Ramada uh, in the style that would have been built during Spanish colonial periods. So there's many places to get into the shade. And if you come uh, when we open up at 8 o'clock in the morning, still quite pleasant. And uh, a walk around the garden is uh, enjoyable at that time. There you go. Maybe it's a good way to kick off a, a Saturday downtown, start at the garden, and then hit the air conditioning somewhere <laughs> else, maybe, <laughs> this time of year. For those who are nervous about the warm weather, um, I think you were talking about the vegetables and the fruit trees, especially. What what do you do? Do you harvest those fruits that are growing on the tree? I know at Impact in our food bank, when it's grapefruit season, the entire community shows up with bags of grapefruit, and we do take it. But it's I think one year we collected about 40,000 pounds of grapefruit to give out through the food bank. So, And I once had a plum tree in my backyard, and it created far more plums than I could ever consume. So... If you have an orchard, then what do you do with all that fruit? Yeah, that's one of the most common questions that we get during tours of the garden is, what do you do with all of this fruit, all of the vegetables? And we do a lot of things with them. Uh, sometimes they're so abundant that we do sell them to local restaurants and bakeries and to uh, a company called Pivot Produce that uh, distributes locally grown organic foods to uh, restaurants and things. We um, keep some of it in the garden and sell it at our little produce stand uh, that's open at our shop uh, during the hours that we're open, which currently are 8 a.m. to noon, Wednesday through Saturday. And uh, we also uh, keep some of the uh, fruits and vegetables in the garden to make things out of it. We have a small commercial kitchen. And so um, one of the things that we really want to do more of is, uh, now that we're getting pretty good at growing all of this produce (laughs) and interpreting the growing of the produce to the public, we want to interpret the eating of this produce to the public and the kind uh, that the tastes that are sometimes different from uh, the kinds of fruits and vegetables that you get in the store and uh, some of the traditional recipes so um, we've got an AmeriCorps position right now who a uh, person who is um, experimenting with recipes and we plan to have more food tastings more food available at festivals made right there in the garden. And we make, uh, uh, specifically with the fruit from the garden, we make uh, preserves, uh, jams and jellies and marmalades, and sell them in our shop. Uh, and those are a favorite of many, many people that come to the to the garden. Well, that's fun. There's nothing as wonderful as something that's grown in the ground and harvested and eaten right away. And then all those jams and jellies would certainly keep on a shelf. So That's right. And some of it, the produce also goes to... Um, organizations like you're talking about. In fact, we have a nice relationship with Iskashita, the uh, refugee network uh, that gleans unneeded, unwanted fruits and vegetables, and they come to the garden fairly regularly and uh, and take away whatever it might be, limes, lemons, uh, grapefruits, uh, chard, collards, whatever we have an abundance of. Very nice. And John, I was going to ask you when you were talking about all these interesting environments inside Biosphere, You also have things going on outside the glass at Biosphere. So what kinds of things are you doing that are outside the, that, you know, closed environment? Yeah, I mean, so Biosphere 2, everybody recognizes the structure and what's under the glass. And and we'll start there and then we'll work out a little bit. um, And I'll I'll get to your your question as well. But, you know, we think of under the glass is trying to improve our understanding of these ecosystem services. Um, and so it's, it's pretty clear, but then over time, where the university's focus was initially there, we've seen an opportunity to expand the research um, into the surrounding area. So the university, we own about 40 acres um, of land right around sort of the bias for two proper. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to partner with folks on campus. So Stewart Observatory has a 6.1 meter radio telescope there. Oh. Um, so they use that to uplink with satellites, and it gives an opportunity not only for researchers, but also undergraduates to learn these types of techniques and skills. Um, So there's only a couple of places in the country, uh, MIT and Moorhead State, that have larger dishes that afford undergraduates the opportunity. So it's a really unique research opportunity. Um, Another one of the faculty in Lunar and Planetary Labs, uh, who's been in the news quite a bit here recently, but he has... uh, He has six uh, optical telescopes on site, and they use those to track objects in space, whether uh, they're sort of natural objects like, you know, asteroids or comets that are coming close to Earth or, um, you know, 
sort of man-made objects. And so there is a huge abundance and there is a need to understand, you know, which one of those are adversarials and which one of those maybe we don't necessarily need to focus our attention on. So he's doing that at Biosphere 2. Um, but then, you know, we, we dive in more on the environmental sciences side of things. And, you know, one of the things we see a lot of is that, especially here in the Southwest, a lot of plants will take advantage of the shade of other plants. So saguaros sure. will establish, you know, they'll, they'll grow under a tree they refer to as a nurse tree. And there's lots of, you'll notice when you look at the landscape, a lot of times the area directly under many trees has, is a little bit greener. It's not as parched, right? So you have a little bit of moisture that's retained there. And so one of our faculty, Greg Baron Gafford, um, who is a faculty in geography, uh, there was some German scientist in the mid-'80s who looked at this sort of shade-crop relationship um, but didn't get a lot of traction. And Greg started to develop and evolve those concepts here more recently. And what he's been able to do is he's co-located traditional agricultural crops underneath solar panels. Oh. And this is a really exciting project because what he has seen is – so he calls it agrivoltaics. Um, and essentially, <laughs> if you think of it, we've mashed together photovoltaics for the solar panels and sure. traditional agriculture, those two words, we put them together. And right out of the gate, what he's seen is that you get a significant increase in the crop productivity and potentially the number of cycles of fruit that you get off of that particular species of crop or harvest in, in many cases if they can produce. They have a longer grow period because they're in the shade. So, you know, on days like today, we, we were all talking about how warm it is, but, you know, plants will stop doing their, stop photosynthesizing on a hot summer day, you know, maybe seven, eight o'clock because by then, you know, it's already 84, maybe 90 degrees and, and quickly approaching 100 that, you know, they're doing everything they can to conserve the water they have. So they close up and they really don't do anything. And, and the, the day is spent just trying to survive. Um, so they don't have a lot of time to produce the sugars and the carbohydrates and, and other things. So what he's found is by putting them in the shade, it lengthens, it allows them to do a little bit more. They're not as stressed by the sun. He's seen at a minimum a 50% reduction in the water that's required to support those crops that are grown under the shade. And there's been an increase in productivity. And what also happens is the plants all give off water. When they open up these little vessels, they release water to the atmosphere, the same place where they take in CO2. But that released water it acts like an evaporative cooler to the solar panel. So it collects on the underside. A little bit of evaporation keeps the panels cool. And you know, one thing that I really didn't know a lot about until we started to, until I started to, to learn more about this is that solar panels' optimal operational temperature is somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so it's not that here. So it's not the Arizona perfect answer that no, it sounds like. No, lots of sun, but yeah. we also, I mean, so it's just like our phones. You know, if we leave our sure. phones in the sun, what do they tell us? Oh, we're getting too hot. They need to shut down because the circuitry just can't handle it. The same thing with panels. And so if you can mitigate that temperature, with this little evaporative cooler, then you increase the efficiency of the panels, or at least the consistency at which it's put, putting out electricity. So there now what Greg is doing is just trying to understand, well, which crops do better in the shade versus out in the sun? So he set up two plots. He's actually set this up at a school not very far from the University of Arizona called Manzo Elementary, and it's really helped to transform the educational experience and, and the entire, I think, attitude and, and how students now embrace science because they actually get to incorporate science into uh, the gardening and supporting of this on their on their campus in addition to what we're doing here. Greg is uh, publishing papers on these types of things. But one of the really interesting things is that he found that, for example, uh, jalapenos do not like to be grown in the shade. They much prefer out in the sun. But like chiltepines or, um, you know, tomatoes uh, or basil or, or chickpeas, they all do much better when he's when they're grown in the shade. And now he has a whole host of undergraduate students who are out taking measurements all the time. They're rotating crops based on the season that they have. Um, he's got graduate students who are now looking at, is there a detectable taste difference from those that are grown in the shade versus those that are grown in full sun? Um, can we actually push that water savings even more? I mean, we're seeing huge water issues across the Southwest. Sure. And, you know, we think of places like Yuma, where almost the overwhelming majority of all of our lettuce comes, you know, they're having to consider shortages of water that's delivered to them for a crop that's very water intensive. And, you know, are there ways in which we can reduce, still maintain that productivity, but potentially reduce the amount of water as needed? Is this one possible solution? There would have to be lots of changes in the way, but... 
you know, we're having to take into consideration a lot of these things. And this is the first step to sort of better understanding what are those dynamics. So agrovoltaics is a really exciting one. And we just got in uh, what they call a freight farm. So this is on the opposite end. We're not growing things out of doors. We're growing things in a very precisely controlled environment. Companies actually converted a shipping container into a very precisely controlled grow environment. And we're going to be growing crops inside, but we also want to see, can we integrate it into a traditional agrivoltaic setting? Um, so we're going to be working with a group of engineering students coming this semester where they're going to see, well, how much, how many solar panels are needed to support the electrical need of this very precisely controlled shipping container grow environment? And then um, can we get it off grid? But also in that area that's covered by the panels, what other crops can we plant potentially to take advantage of the shade to optimize their productivity. So taller statured plants outside, you know, things like leafy greens, microgreens, maybe some of the herbs grown inside. And so in a sense, you get the best of both environments. That's pretty exciting stuff, especially for farmers right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know that with the reduction in water and everybody's concern in the state of Arizona about water, a lot of the farmers are having their water um, limits, if you will, reduced. And so finding unique, innovative ways to help them water those plants on much less water is pretty exciting. It seems like Arizona, with all this, everyone wonders why not put solar panels everywhere because of all the sun. So what a great relationship to bring farming and solar panels together. That's a nice use yeah, of the land. And, well, and he's working with a farmer up in Colorado. But, yeah, the next question is, is, is it scalable? Sure. And, you know, how do you definitely techniques for harvesting and planting if you moved in this direction right. would have to, you know, would have to also evolve and adapt. But, you know, one of the things um, some folks in the industry were telling me is that, especially with this next generation of farmers, there's far fewer who sort of want to take on the family legacy of farming because, you know, it doesn't really pay a lot. It's a heck of a lot of work and a lot of long hours. And so, that land, though, in many cases is zoned for agricultural practices. And so repurposing it is oftentimes very challenging from what I understand. But if mm -hmm. you can co-locate uh, you know, energy production and still have some farming going on, then you're able to not necessarily change or have to go through the process of changing that zoning. And again, you get a, a sort of a dual benefit out of the land. And, and Greg, these are his words, he really likes to refer to it. He's harvesting the sun twice. So he's <laughs> growing the plants and, and producing some electricity as well. I think that's very exciting. It's going to be fun to see what comes out of that. So hopefully we'll get a lot of that here in Arizona. That's, that's, that's the hope is what can we do to, you know, bring this to folks who are doing things. And there's, you know, the great thing about the University of Arizona is it has a lot of extension offices. It is a land grant institution. Um, you know, they're really well known for their agricultural college. And so um, Joaquin Ruiz, who is our executive director, has brought in folks who are doing these types of things in Yuma. And so looking at, you know, are there sites in Yuma where we could test this on a larger scale? Because right now our spot, our, our plot at Biosphere 2 is relatively small. The, the plot at Manzo Elementary is, is relatively small. But, you know, the next step is, is it's shown to be, have a lot of promise. Now how do we, com you know, how do we take it to the commercial scale? Sure. Well, I think a lot of farmers would be interested. Doesn't that sound like a fun thing, Kendall? <laughs> well, it sure does. This is an area of potential collaboration between Mission Garden and Biosphere 2 because among the, the new garden plots that uh, are currently being planted or planned is a garden, uh, probably the final garden plot that we'll create called Tomorrow's Garden. We want to create, uh, we want to be relevant to the future of gardening, in other words, not just the four or 5,000 year history of gardening here. So uh, we plan uh, tomorrow's garden, which uh, will represent best practices to adapt to f the future of gardening in Tucson. We'll have, as you said, even scarcer water, higher overall temperatures, more extreme weather events, including more periods of extreme hot temperatures, and uh, perhaps less predictable rainfall. And uh, so we're considering for tomorrow's garden, um, or as, as we begin to plan this in the fall, actually, we'll probably be considering some of the traditional crops that are very low water use crops like agave, like nopal, cactus, 
like uh, tepary beans, which actually produce fewer beans if you water them too much. <laughs> but we're also looking uh, not only back to some of these traditional crops, but forward to things like ag- uh, hydroponics, which uses 80 to 90 percent less water than traditional agriculture. And we're very interested in agrivoltaics. Uh, I think that would be a fine thing to perhaps integrate into tomorrow's garden. Uh, and I'll, I'll be advocating for that as we start to plan that this fall. Well, and then you'll have some, some resources, too, which is the fun for me of this show, is just helping our listeners learn more about the nonprofits and the activities going on in Tucson and, and all the different ways we can collaborate. Impact is also going to collaborate with Biosphere on the freight farms because they're going to be producing a lot of food. So we'll break for a quick moment, and then we'll be back to hear more. Today's program is brought to you by SKIP, the Social Service Contractors Indemnity Pool. SKIP is a member-owned, member-directed insurance provider with more than three decades of insuring Arizona social service organizations for their property, general and professional liability, and auto claim exposures. With an Arizona-based staff of claim underwriting and risk management professionals, SKIP specializes in providing personalized service, affordable premiums, and coverage which meets and often exceeds the state of Arizona's contract requirements for social service providers. For more information, visit our website at www.sscip.org or ask your insurance agent about protecting your organization with insurance coverage through SKIP. Well, we're back and we were just starting to talk about, um, well, we've been talking about farming, but also how this new project at Biosphere is going to be producing food in freight farms. And they're going to be donating all of this lettuce and different things that get grown to the university pantry for students and also to impact. So, John, do you want to elaborate a little more on what you're going to be growing? And yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited about these emerging partnerships. Um, so we fundraised to be able to, to get this, this freight farm. And one of the funding agencies is a group on campus, a sustainability group that write a grant and it, and it evaluates those. That's the students who evaluate them. And then based on merit, they, they award uh, to individual groups and to those proposals. And so we are fortunate to, to be able to, to get one of those awards. And what we're really excited about, and we were already planning to do this, but it was great that they put it into uh, their stipulations for them awarding us, is that they wanted us to donate 50% of the produce that we generate at a minimum from this freight farms um, to Campus Pantry. And so they, they already do this and have a really a well-established resource for students on campus. Um, the Controlled Environments and Agriculture Center Um, which is an extension or part of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. If you see it, if you've driven around sort of the Campbell and River area, you see sort of some traditional agricultural land, you see some greenhouses. Well, that is a place where a lot of the University of Arizona students uh, study, especially those who are looking at systems engineering or or greenhouse cultivation. And a lot of those produce, um, they produce quite a few of them. And so they're able to donate them back. We're going to do the same type of thing. And what's really exciting, um, we're just beginning to learn about this. Like I said, it was delivered on Tuesday to us, so we've got a lot to learn. But a lot of the literature uh, from the company, and they have an entire network of farmers who are using this technology to grow crops um, in, in a wide range of areas, is that inside you have a grow space of about 320 square feet. And the productivity of that 320 square feet over the course of a year, they say, is equivalent to about two and a half acres. So Jason, who is a person who's heading this up for us, you know, he came down and sat down and he says, you know, John, we're going to produce a lot of food potentially. So <laughs> we need to figure out what we're going to do with this. So we're really excited because we think we have a great opportunity to, to make a, a positive contribution and this developing partnership, not only with the, the, the campus pantry, but also, you know, I live in Oracle um, and I know there's a, a wide range uh, of, of folks in varying economic um, levels. And so it's exciting to hear what we can do with Impact and the Catalina Pantry as well. And, you know, we're excited because one of the things is Biosphere is a little bit of ways out of town. And so uh, I hope that this program that we're just getting off the ground will be attractive um, and it will provide opportunities not only for students, uh, but also for the community, especially right in our general area, to come and help us with this project. Oh, sure. We at Impact have a senior feeding program. 
excuse me, that we operate with the USDA. So it's a special senior box that has some calcium benefits. It's got shelf-stable milk, powdered milk, and some cheese. But, you know, when we deliver it, it's, it's also got a lot of canned foods and cereal, and they're always looking for produce. So we're now going out and buying produce and then sometimes meat and breads, the rest of it to supplement it. So we have over 100 seniors in Oracle and in the Copper Corridor who we're feeding and some that we deliver to because they're homebound. So our plan is to put a lot of that produce into those senior boxes. So it'll be helping not just students, but seniors and families with little kids. So it'll be really a project that feeds people of all ages. Well, we're excited. And, you know, I'm glad that you brought Kendall and I together because one of the things we're really looking to do is, is as, as Kendall, you mentioned with your, your future garden looking forward, we also want to look at ways that we can demonstrate, um, you know, some of these traditional uh, agricultural crops that have been used for centuries and have shown very high success rates in the climate that we have here. And you know, how could we take advantage of the, the different types of grow environments that we have? Uh, we've already initiated some conversations with folks at Native Seeds and how can not only freight farms, but Biosphere 2 as a whole uh, be used because of its unique growing environments and the differences that we have in such a relatively small facility um, how can we use those those spaces to potentially grow crops that maybe they have a little bit more difficulty growing and boost their seed bank as well? Yeah, that's exactly what uh, Mission Garden is all about, is uh, demonstrating these uh, relatively drought-tolerant uh, varieties, whether it be uh, the Native American crops of corn, beans, and squash, and cotton, and agaves, and cacti, or um, s- some of the varieties of fruits and vegetables brought here by the uh, Europe- first Europeans here, which have been here long enough now and have adapted to this region so that they're uh, relatively um, productive and use relatively little water here. Yeah. So this, I mean, we're really excited about these partnerships and it's an expanding endeavor for us at, at Biosphere because again, much of our focus was under the glass and taking our tropical rainforest and you know, a team of researchers coming in and subjecting it to an extended drought or changing um, the temperature of it or changing the atmospheric composition. But now we get to move outside the glass as well and, and, and have relevant experiments that potentially are going to make not only impacts locally, but potentially impacts globally. Oh, sure. And I know in Pinal County, they're doing a lot of um, vertical farming. So these farmers, as you were saying, they still want to have a farm for the tax benefits and for the zoning, but they can put up a warehouse and build a whole crop in a warehouse, grow a whole crop. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> yeah, we Excuse see me. we see the University of Arizona, um, and, and again, I, I mentioned this, the, the folks that control the Environments and Agriculture Center, they're, they're known worldwide for um, helping to refine and teach techniques that are needed to, to not only grow in greenhouses, but as you mentioned, sort of these vertically farming. And, and sort of the next generation of that looking forward is, is a, a facility like freight farms. And so these are being dropped in inner city areas and being used by inner city schools or entrepreneurs to provide fresh produce. And the great thing about it is, is that, you know, in most cases you significantly reduce your transport time, which oftentimes decreases the quality or the taste of the produce that you're getting. Um, you're going to reduce your carbon footprint because you're not having to drive it across the country great distances. Um, and in many cases, you can actually increase your crop rotation and, and supply you know, fresh produce to other areas where they otherwise might not have an opportunity to get them. It is going to be fun. And I think like you were saying, Kendall, you know, there's nothing that tastes better than something right out of your orchard compared to the market. Right. You know. Our, our motto at Mission Garden is tasting history, and that's in part because um, many of these heirloom or heritage varieties of fruits and vegetables taste a bit different from the ones that you get in the store, right? So uh, an example I like to use is the pomegranates we grow. We're, we're growing the historic variety of pomegranate, the first variety brought here by the first Europeans in the eight, probably 18th century. And it's quite different from the one variety uh, that you can get in the store. It's a lovely variety. You crack it open and it's brilliant uh, crimson red inside and has a wonderful tart taste. But these heritage pomegranates are white inside 
or maybe a little bit pinkish, the arils, the fruit around the seeds are larger, and it's quite sweet. So it's really a different taste than you would get in uh, in uh, a, a supermarket bought fruit. Uh, and there's many other examples. We have Mexican sweet limes in the garden, which uh, again are um, pretty easy to grow here in this climate and relatively drought tolerant for a lime tree, but produce these wonderful limes that you can, in when they're ripe in uh, late December and January, you can peel them and eat them like an orange and they're not sour at all. Oh gosh, that just makes me <laughs> salivate. It's like <laughs> thinking of that, you know, biting into a lime. No, it's it's a completely different taste experience from any other citrus fruit that you're likely to have eaten. And this is just uh, is true over and over again for the fruits and vegetables in, in Mission Garden. So um, you get the double benefit of tried and true fruit and vegetable varieties that work in this climate and that are, are tasty because they're different from the commercial varieties in the store and they're fresh. Sure. That's that's pretty fun. I might have to take another trip down to the garden this summer, it sounds like, and come home with some jam That's and maybe right. try one of those limes. Are the limes out now? Or it's too late for the limes, maybe? Not right now, but you can get our sour orange marmalade, our Seville orange marmalade made from our, uh, you know, this is another um, lesson that I've learned in, in at Mission Garden, is that there's certain fruits that were grown historically and highly valued that we, we don't value so much anymore. We're surrounded by, in, in the Tucson metro area, by these funny sour oranges that uh, just today there were some uh, folks in the garden who said, yeah, we just, we just threw those at each other when we were kids. <laughs> But uh, they're Seville oranges, and they're prized for making marmalades and many different citrus flavorings, from salsas to marinades to all kinds of things. The world's marmalades really come from these sour Seville oranges. And right now at Mission Garden, we're selling the marmalade that we made this spring from those oranges. Oh, then we'll be in for sure. <laughs> we, my family has a British background, and so we grow up on, grew up on that. And marmalade is my favorite jam. You know, a lot of people don't even like marmalade, <laughs> I think. Oh, yeah. And our producer's raising his hand. He's one of those. But <laughs> I, and I, and I think people think that it is tart or it's just different or they don't like the texture of the peel in it and what have you. But when my husband and I just finished off a jar of homemade Seville orange marmalade, but it was funny because the British woman who made it for us called it Seville. Ah, yes. It's the Seville orange, and so we have been calling it that, but we just polished it off. But we were eating it as slowly as we possibly could. <laughs> so we'll be in to get some. That's pretty exciting for us. Folks from the U.K. have toured the garden and corrected my pronunciation of Seville orange and also said, oh, yes, of course, uh, we know Seville oranges from Spain. That's the source of all of our marmalade in, in the U.K. Sure. Oh, that's fun. So many fun things going on. I think... Um, what else do you have going on in the garden this time of year because it is so warm? Well, uh, one really cool thing that we're going to do on um, the evening of Friday, August 12th is Critter Night. Oh, so uh, you, you mentioned the fact that there's a lot of life that comes out in the summer with the heat here, particularly in mornings and evenings, and particularly as the humidity goes up and uh, a lot of insects start to be active and a lot of reptiles and things. And so it's the perfect time to come to Mission Garden and there'll be wildlife agencies and, and nonprofits and wildlife experts talking about all kinds of wildlife and, in, and indeed having uh, example animals there like snakes and, mm -hmm. and tortoises. And, <laughs> and we have a canal in the garden in which we have um, not only uh, native aquatic plants to this region, but Gila top minnows, a, uh, a small one to two inch long fish that is on the endangered species list because we've dried up so many of our local springs and streams and rivers. And uh, now Mission Gardens Canal is one of the places that is a refuge for them to live in. Oh, that's exciting. And how do you keep water in the canal? I mean, how do you keep that from evaporating? Well, uh, only a few percent evaporate uh, each year, and we replace it with uh, regular city water. Of course, historically, the floodplain of the Santa Cruz River would have been crisscrossed by canals coming off the, the flow in the Santa Cruz River and the wetland that was just upstream for, from us where we are at the base of a mountain. Um, we wanted to 
we want to bring back as many of these historic uh, characteristics of the broad uh, agricultural floodplain that once was, and one of them was to build a canal. We don't irrigate with it because drip irrigation is so much more conservative of water, uh, sure. especially over the historic practice of flood irrigation, where you would open a place in the canal, allow it to go out and flood patches of corn or the orchard or whatever it might be. Uh, but we replace that water and we circulate it so that it stays fresh and we have a lot of uh, aquatic plants in there removing nutrients so that we don't get a lot of algae growth. And it's quite a, a wonderful... Um, and it's, it's brought in a whole range of new wildlife to the garden, a lot of birds using it, uh, a lot of arthropods and uh, macroinvertebrates in the water. And uh, we also have a trail camera that we set up. And around midnight or 1 a.m. I was going to say, <laughs> uh, not at high noon. <laughs> uh, we see pictures and videos on that camera of uh, bobcats coming to drink and raccoons. Into the garden? Yes, They indeed. just hop over the wall? It's a high wall. But it is can, a high wall. They can get over it. <laughs> That's kind of a scary thought. <laughs> Fortunately, javelinas can't get over the wall, <laughs> uh, or they would probably eat everything and maybe some deer down from the Tucson Mountains. But uh, no, we have a, a, a healthy relationship with all the critters in the garden. We have a few pest insects. We try to deal with them all with organic means. And, uh, and so that's going to be a wonderful thing. And um, we're, we are open, you know, Wednesday through Saturday. Mornings are a wonderful time to come and stroll around the shady garden and, and uh, experience uh, this historical agriculture. And, you know, a lot of the crops grow during the summer. A lot of the Native American crops grow during the summer. Um, with the arrival of European crops, it really diversified the agriculture here and made year-round agriculture possible. Uh, but the tried and true corn and beans and squash and other crops that Native Americans were growing, like the chiltepin, like uh, cotton, uh, a domesticated form of the devil's claw plant from which they got uh, fibers for basketry. Uh, all of these things will be growing in the garden over the summer uh, and more. So there's always plenty of crops to see and learn about there. I think that's fun. My husband and I go out on the Rail X because we're up in the northwest part of Tucson. And it is amazing to me how, like right now with the saguaros blooming and then all of the fruiting at the end of June and and then the just the colors of the prickly pear you know, between the flowers and the fruits there is always so much going on in the desert and I think people who don't live in the desert or who live outside of Tucson certainly picture Tucson to be like the desert postcard you know like sand saguaro skull not not very green and it was one of the reasons we selected Tucson as a final destination for our families because it's so gorgeous here. And I think when we have friends who come in from out of state, they're always amazed at how green the desert is. And to your point, so much is growing because of the monsoons. Yes, and that desert postcard is there, and it gets especially green during the summer monsoon season. But Mission Garden really amazes people who visit it uh, because that's the other side of the coin. We had these big riparian moist areas from along the Santa Cruz and the Rito where uh, historically there was wonderful wet wildlife habitat and then an agrarian setting where people were growing lots and lots of crops. Today we think of the Santa Cruz River as that eroded ditch that kind of <laughs> flow, <laughs> goes through Tucson. That's fair. Uh, but that wasn't there before 1890. Oh. Um, that was an erosionary event that happened with big rains and new canal projects at that time. Historically, if you look at uh, drawings and photographs before 1890, uh, especially the Carlton Watkins 1880 photograph from A Mountain that looks across this broad floodplain, reaching from the base of A Mountain all the way over to downtown, almost a mile wide, full of crops. And uh, you'll see how different it was. And unfortunately, today we've covered that broad floodplain. Uh, we've dried up the, river, the surface water resource, and we've covered that broad floodplain with commercial and residential development. But Mission Garden is a, a, a four-acre area uh, that brings that back to life. And if you step outside of Mission Garden or go up to A Mountain and look across that historic floodplain, and multiply Mission Garden many, many times in your imagination, I think you'll get a picture of, of uh, uh, another 
setting in um, another natural setting in Tucson that we don't have anymore. Sure. Well, that would be interesting to do. Plenty of time ahead in the summer. That'll be fun. Thank you. I was going to ask you what your role is at Mission Gardens, Kindle. You talked about giving a tour when you do a tour. So what do you do at the garden? Well, I am the outreach coordinator, so I uh, help to elevate the image of Tucson uh, by promoting uh, Mission Garden, uh, of Mission Garden by promoting Mission Garden, and getting the word out about it. We do a lot of emails, we do a lot of social media, and we do a lot of events and uh, to draw draw people in. Uh, small events like um, medicinal herb walks and bird walks, and uh, a program that. Archaeology Southwest does called Hands On Archaeology. And we have bigger events, like just recently we had an event that drew nearly 200 people for the inauguration of one of our new garden plots, a plot that we call uh, the Africa in the Americas Garden, demonstrating crops that have their origins in Africa and other crops that are important to um, the cuisines of people of African descent over the centuries in this region. Uh, in in America as a whole. Uh, We have festivals for our wheat harvest, for our harvest of uh, quinces, for our harvest of pomegranates. Um, We, uh, corresponding to the Tucson-wide Agave Heritage Festival in late April, we have events in the garden where we actually harvest and roast in an underground pit oven, as was done historically, agave hearts to demonstrate how that food resource was created. And uh, a lot of people, their first thought about agave is uh, mezcal and tequila. That's, of course, a big part of the agave story further south where larger, juicier agaves grow. But these desert agaves were heavily used, especially by the Hohokam people, for food and fiber. So we demonstrate things like that. Well, on our website for the show... We have everybody's um, websites and contact information. And I imagine on your website, people can go and find out about all these different classes or events. So they're all up there. Is that right? That is right. Mission Garden. Have a calendar. Yes. Great. So we can add some of those things to our to-do list this summer. That'll be kind of fun. John, I was going to ask you, I know I was saying when we first got here, we came to Biosphere as tourists. And so is it still, even though you have all these experiments going on inside and all these amazing things, are tourists still going through Biosphere? Is it still open? I'm, and after COVID, I'm sure things are different. They are different, but people are still visiting. We welcome visitors, uh, you know, much like Mission Garden. That's a, a big portion of what we do because it's an opportunity for us to reach out um, to the public and to let them know what we're doing firsthand. And that's what's really exciting about this world-class research lab that's right here in Southern Arizona is that, you know, you think of the University of Arizona and all the research that comes out, but a lot of it is sort of behind closed doors. It's a little mysterious. You know, you and I can't just readily walk down the hallway, peek in the door and say, hey, you know, what are you doing today? Right. Um, At Biosphere 2, you know, we've broken down some of those traditional barriers and you can come through and you can actually see the systems. Um, Today, the tour is different than it was if you visited several years ago pre-COVID. Um, that's because we've had to adapt like everybody has with you know, distancing and changing the dynamics rather than leading people through in, in sort of large groups. Now, we've moved towards an app-based tour, so it's, it's at your own pace, and you download the Bias for Two app. You can do that you know, whether you're, when you get up to Bias for Two, or you could download it today if you wanted to and sort of look at what we're doing. Um, but then come out and visit, and you can go through many of the systems that we have, hear what, what's going on. And so that's what's really exciting. And, you know, on an, a year that's not a, a COVID year, we were, we were getting about 100,000 people um, a year out to Bias for Two. So it's a big part of what helps to support our research and our education programs. And without the support of the public, we wouldn't be able to do all this amazing research. Sure. Well, that's exciting that it's still open and that I wasn't sure it sounds like, you know, at some point some of those experiments would be closed. But I suppose human involvement, you know, somebody walking through the rainforest while it's in a drought isn't really going to change the end result much. No, it. you're right. Some For some of those experiments, we, we can sort of have two of those sort of coexisting at the same time, the, the visitor and the experimental space. There's other times, though, and that's what's great about Bias for Two and its flexibility. We do have to 
to minimize or uh, reduce the public's incursion into those areas. But there's really sort of, I mean, our, our researchers explain that. So in this drought experiment, we had to close the rainforest to the public. But the reason why is that there were researchers that were parts of teams that were looking at the different compounds the plants give off. So these volatile organic compounds. And, you know, you and I, the, the lotion that we use, the right. deodorant that we use, these all have potentially contributing volatile organic compounds that could confuse the signal. And so for that reason, um, they were very selective about who they allowed to come in. But that's what's exciting about Biosphere 2 is you can bottle it up, you can study it, and then you can open it back up and reset it and then do another experiment. Because researchers have always desired, you know, could we go to the Amazon basin and, and plunk a dome over the top of it or, you know, t- take a section of the ocean and really precisely control that. And we know in nature that's very difficult. So bias for two is that intermediate step. It's a it's a scaling tool. Sure. And you know, like you were saying, when I was young and I remember when you're know, going to the moon was just not even really a reality. It was kind of science fiction. And so when Biosphere was built, that was such an incredible, amazing thing. And it's it is just gonna be different to see how all of it is changing in the future and how we grow plants and and like you were saying Kendall to have the you know the ancient plants and the ancient seeds and and then to also have a tomorrow garden that's pretty cool and maybe you'll have vertical farming or maybe you'll have a freight farm or who knows what it'll look like and i was thinking John when you were talking about shade and the photovoltaics and that whole idea of growing underneath photovoltaic panels i was thinking of the three sisters you know that native american combination where the corn puts a shadow on the squash and the beans are crawling up the corn and how it's kind of this symbiotic relationship. So it'll be interesting to see what Tucson looks like in the future Uh, and the world itself. That might be the next thing that Greg Baron Gafford looks at under the solar panels is uh, not just single crops, but guilds of crops Mm -hmm. like the three sisters growing together there. Sure. Well, it'll be a lot of fun I think before we wrap up, is there anything either of you wants to add? Because sometimes, you know, we get to talking and if there's something you want the listeners to know before we wrap it up, I want to give you an opportunity. Well, no, I I thank you for this opportunity. It's been great meeting you in person, you and Kendall at Mission Gardens. I'm hoping we can can collaborate and, you know, letting people know that we we too are open uh, every day of the week. And so you can come out and visit and our information like Mission Gardens is on our website. It's a great resource to start. Sounds wonderful. I think a lot of people will hopefully visit both these places in the summer. Biosphere True is a w- wonderful place, yeah, and I uh, look forward to going there again sometime soon. I just want people to know that um, the next couple things that are ripening at Mission Garden are our figs and our grapes in probably in July. So look forward to that. There's always something to uh, taste there. Oh, you're making me hungry, too. <laughs> I love mission figs. Are they mission figs or Kadota figs? A lot okay. of them are the mission figs, yeah. All right. Well, the McClure family will be there for sure, <laughs> and will be certainly involved with Biosphere in the very near future and the freight farming and some vertical farming to bring food to the community. So I thank you both for joining me and for all our listeners today for tuning in and downloading us and enjoying the podcast. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>